let's understand and jump into the IP NFT, so the intellectual property NFT. And for that, we basically have to look at two things. And just remember here that this is a framework and we're not talking about a certain technical implementation of this, but just the conceptual framework that can be implemented with different tools on different blockchains uh, uh, in different ways. So the two things that we look at are the legal contract and the smart contract. The legal contract is really important because we want our IPNFT to be in, uh, enforceable in certain jurisdictions. And the smart contract is important because we want to manage the ownership of the certain asset, let's say the legal contract or a data asset or a patent, to be managed via the blockchain. Why is that interesting? Because if we can manage it via the blockchain, we take a lot of transaction costs out of the equation. Normally, if you would transact around IP, you would transact around any any legal contract, you would need to have involved lawyers, you, you would need to go through lengthy negotiations. But with a blockchain, we can actually create standards that enable us to very quickly and easily transact around such assets and use them also for certain, let's say, other use cases that arise uh, within that ecosystem. And I will shed a light on that in a little bit. Now, Let's, re let's return to the legal contract because I think it is important to understand how those two things work together. The legal contract actually references the smart contract and the smart contract references the legal contract, making sure that there's a bond which can't really be broken. So how does it work? The legal contract is actually two contracts. It's one contract, which is, it could be the sponsored research agreement, it could be a patent, it could be an agreement for future IP or even a sales agreement for a data asset. And the second agreement is actually an agreement that is stating that the parties agree to transfer the ownership of the first agreement and the parties that are involved in that uh, onto someone who is holding a certain token on chain. So the second agreement basically states, hey, whoever holds a certain asset in a certain smart contract on the blockchain is the owner and the counterparty in the legal agreement that it's connected to. So you could even like really think about it if you think about a PDF where you have the, normally the, the counterparties being identified by the name and the address and, uh, and maybe further identifiers. In this case, the, the counterparties are identified by a smart contract address and by a, um, yeah, by a, a token and potentially even by, uh, by a address that is, that is giving out that specific token, right? Okay, so now we captured how legal contracts reference the smart contract. Now, how does the smart contracts contract reference a legal contract? And that is coming back to what is being connected on chain um, into the smart contract. And I already referenced last time uh, on the last slide that the uh, for artworks is basically the artwork that is connected into this. In our case, we are connecting the legal contract into the into the smart contract, so that anybody um, who has the the, the token basically or knows of the token can actually look okay what is the legal contract that is connected to it now there's a bit of a caveat there and that is there's two different use cases that we have here legal contracts which are private and legal contracts which can be made public because maybe there is a grant from uh, from government or something like this so in the case where it's private we actually have technologies to also make the access to the data that is connected to the token connected on chain um, only accessible to people who actually own the token. And that now brings us into the modularity that we are currently working on bringing into IP NFTs. Um, because there, you already hear there's already two use cases here just for storing that data. And there's a lot of different other use cases that we currently soon see in the DSI ecosystem arising where people have data that needs to be public, data that is being added later to the token, data that needs to be private, maybe data that, that can be partially private, partially public. And we're currently working on making this whole framework more modular so those different use cases can be accustomed and um, can be actually accounted for and we can pull in the modules that we need. And just to highlight a little bit here, the, the third asset which actually comes into play when looking into intellectual pro uh, property NFTs is uh, the data storage aspect. And that is there might be connected to a sponsored research agreement, there might be the decision that, hey, we want to um, 
store the data that is connected to the sponsored research agreement that is arising from this research uh, accessible to the one who's funded it directly. And as the one who funded it could decide to at any point to sell the IP NFT to someone else, which is now the owner and therefore the owner of the data that is arising of it, that data needs to be accessible and potentially only accessible to the one owning the, the token the, uh, on chain. So this is one of the use cases that, for example, we have encountered in the last year that we that we are using um, data storages, which only allow people who have the token to access the data. Now, that can be solved in different ways. It can be done with centralized data storages. Let's say a university has its own data storage where it stores that, or you are scared that, for example, a centralized entity could uh, cut their servers, cut access to it, and then whatever is connected to the token on chain actually not is not available anymore. You want to store it therefore on a centralized, a decentralized data storage network where uh, it is being hosted by a whole network of people working together to make it accessible. Um, those are different, again, going different in the modularity, different aspects that we're currently uh, working on um, and the different ways of how those solutions uh, could contribute to, uh, to the intellectual property NFT framework. Okay, so just to recap, because this I think was a lot of information, we have the legal contract, which makes sure there is a uh, enforceability in a jurisdiction um, that is referencing a smart contract, which the smart contract is also referencing the legal contract. And the smart contract uh, is basically there to manage the ownership and the counterparties in the contract and therefore makes it super um, easy to transfer. Another aspect and an upside that comes with it is that entities which are working on chain, which I mentioned before, like the decentralized autonomous organizations, the DAOs, can actually own those assets on chain because they might not actually have a bank account or a, a, an address yet, but they, can, they might be a loose form of people who are interested in a certain area and want to um, to just fund certain uh, research and then they can actually own this asset on chain and, uh, and and manage it via their DAO, which they would not be able if the IPNFT wouldn't exist. And that's one of the major use cases actually for the DAOs of this framework. Now, the last part, as I stated, is an optional data storage unit, which is potentially adding additional information um, to the uh, NFT that can be linked into it. Uh, similar like the legal contract is linked into it uh, via, via URLs. That's how you can envision it. It's just like a link to, 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 to a data storage location that can be accessible. Now the data can be again optionally encrypted or, or publicly available depending on the needs. And then there's other services uh, which enable you to encrypt and decrypt, making sure that only people who own the, uh, the token on, on chain actually get to see the information. But given that there's different use cases next to just funding research, maybe another one is just a, uh, let's say, an agreement for uh, researching a certain molecule in a lab, um, which is, you know, uh, something that, for example, LabDAO is working on with their network is, is something where we believe this general framework can also help that and is, uh, is, is using basically certain components of this make it work for them while other components are not not being looked at in that case. All right.